So let me just wish out loud that we were all together in the spring, closed up in a barn with no ventilation, but with all kinds of farm animals in the barn. I want to awaken your senses so that when we move through this passage, you can see, hear, smell, touch, and taste this passage. So I want to read verses 1 through 7, which is, the material we covered last Sunday. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Totalian governments get to do that. Can you imagine if on April 15th the, gov the government decreed that we would all have to go somewhere and, and be counted and, and pay our taxes? This was a, a sudden road trip was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. This would be about an 80 to 90 mile trip. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. In the King James Version, it says the time came for her to be delivered. And if you've been nine months pregnant, you know that there's a sense in which you deliver, but there's also a sense in which you are delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, common livestock feeding trough because there was no guest room available for them. So Jesus might have been born in a cave because most barns in the first century were in caves, possibly in the lower level of somebody's house because they would bring the animals in. Adds a total dynamic to spring cleaning if you do that. So I just want you to see and hear and taste and touch and smell as we move through the rest of this passage. Are you familiar with something called maternal instinct? Moms have a sixth sense. Sometimes we say moms have eyes in the backs of their head. Moms seem to have an inside track when it comes to knowledge about their kids. After I reached adulthood, on at least one occasion, I can remember my mom saying to me, Ricky, she called me that, Richard Lee Jordan, when she was angry with me, she said, Ricky, when I was pregnant with you, I could already tell you were going to be such a handful. And I didn't prove her wrong. She just kind of knew. We have this beautiful Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? It's a speculative song. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would? And then, you know, the lyrics of the hymn. I'm wondering, Mary, did you know that your baby was going to be so controversial? Because the fact is, newborn Jesus in the manger was already attracting the wrong kinds of people according to the standards of of the prevailing organized religion at that time. Let's talk about shepherds, because we're about to meet them in the passage. Shepherds in the first century were working class people, kind of like Joseph was a working class man. Their work was really messy. Have you been around sheep? And their work was also nomadic because if you put a flock of sheep somewhere, they're going to mow. <laughs> Pretty soon, you're going to have to move so that they can find something else to mow. Shepherds were constantly moving their flocks so that the sheep could graze and also have water. Their work was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sheep 
were and are notoriously stupid and stubborn and skittish animals. First century shepherds were notoriously hard men and hard boys. If you were a shepherd, you were tough. I'm talking old school tough. Shepherds were sometimes on the wrong end of class prejudice. They had a reputation. Many of them were hired, so they didn't have a personal investment in the sheep. They weren't their sheep. It was their job. Again, 24-7, but it was their job. Even in John chapter 10, when Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd, he contrasts himself with the hireling. Do you remember that in John chapter 10? The hireling who really isn't looking out for the best interests of the sheep. And so shepherds sometimes had a reputation for not being the most honest. Shepherds were agriculturally and religiously necessary, but they were neither admired nor respected. Shepherds were afterthoughts. You ever felt like an afterthought? Sometimes it hurts more to be an afterthought than it hurts to actually be rejected. It's its own form of rejection. It means you just really don't count. You just really don't matter. And that was what it was like to be a shepherd. So now we continue in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Living out in the fields is one Greek word. And March through November, this was their home. They were living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. For these shepherds, an eventful night was defined as a night where a predatory animal might attack. Or, more commonly, the sheep would suddenly panic at absolutely nothing. And you would have to chase them down and regather them in the middle of the night. During those crises, it remained dark. It was busy, but it was dark. Look what happens next. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. That phrase, glory of the Lord, harkens back to the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And God's glory was always brilliant, lighter than light, impossibly bright. And they were terrified. They feared a great fear. The King James Version says they were sore afraid. Have you ever become so afraid that you were sore? <laughs> that it actually physically hurt? They were terror stricken. And so the angel led with what angels seem to always have to lead with. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for 50% of the people. 90% of the people, all, 100%. So we already see that God's heart is inclusive and the gospel is inclusive. Today in the town of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Briefly unpacking Savior, Messiah, Lord. The angels were saying to the shepherds, God has been born. There would be no mistake. Shepherds would get that message. The deliverer, the chosen one. God has been born. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby in Jerusalem, at the temple, in the Holy of Holies, surrounded by angels. Is that what the text, is that what the text says? You will find the baby in Caesar's palace, taking over for Caesar. Does that what, does the passage say that? 
This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a common livestock feeding trough. That's kind of an underwhelming sign. And so accompanying the angels was an overwhelming choir. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Have you ever wondered how long this took? It didn't take me long to read. It may not have taken that much longer for it to actually happen. Suddenly, the sky was lit up. It was more brilliant than brilliant. And there were words, and then suddenly, whoosh, it was over. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found, the Passion Translation says, they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the common livestock feeding trough. This is the point at which they, I wish they would make a study Bible with a scratch and sniff option so that we could just scratch and, and, and take this in because this is such a human scene, such an earthy, even gamey scene. Um, you've, you've got the smells of birth. You've got the smells of the animals, the output of the animals. And then you've got the smell of the shepherds in this small closed in space when they had seen him this baby they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them but mary here comes that maternal instinct a holy maternal instinct in this case but mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So, with the exception of Mary and Joseph, the first group of people who saw Jesus were shepherds. O oh, come, let us adore him, O oh, come, let rough, dirty, overlooked, and socially inferior shepherds adore him, Christ the Lord. Do you get it? How many of you have nativity scenes? I love them. We have several in, in this church building. And frequently, for the sake of convenience, but also for the optics, we, we cram together the shepherds and the magi um, at the manger in our nativities. The fact is, the Magi came along later, and we pick up with that in Matthew chapter 2. From a thousand miles away, these Magi, Magos, which means magic, they were astrologers, maybe sorcerers, they were wealthy pagan priests of a foreign religion with entourages. They saw this star, and so they made a 1,000 mile journey by the time they reached bethlehem jesus was no longer identified as a baby he was called the child he was a toddler moms dads remember that bittersweet time when your baby is looking a little less like a baby and looking more like a child and you celebrate it but you're also hurting just a little bit jesus was a child with mary and they were living in a house and so they found, the star guided them, and they found Jesus, and they gave him gifts. O come, let us adore him. O come, let pagan astrological outsiders adore him, Christ the Lord. Do you get it? God is calling in a couple of groups of people socioeconomically a little different culturally a little different but they would both be outsiders 
and those are the folks God is bringing in. Newborn Jesus in the manger was already attracting the wrong kinds of people according to the standards of the prevailing organized religion at that time. The child, the toddler Jesus, was already attracting the wrong kinds of people according to the standards of the prevailing organized religion at that time. And as an adult, during that three-year period where he had disciples and was teaching and preaching and healing and raising people from the dead, adult Jesus in the Gospels constantly attracted the wrong kinds of people according to the standards of the prevailing organized religion at that time. And it actually got him in a heap of trouble. So what kind of church do you think Jesus is interested in building now? Do you think there's a possibility that the church Jesus is building needs to look like the manger scene? Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And while we're at it, oh, come let us bring with us all kinds of people, the right kinds of people and the wrong kinds of people so that we can all adore Christ the Lord together. On the back of your prayer sheet, you have a faith exercise. We won't go through it this morning, but I hope you spend the week with this faith exercise because it pushes us, it stretches us, it challenges us to find out who's missing in the manger. In fact, that's the cover of your worship bulletin. You see the person with the question mark? Who's missing? Because in the heart of God, God doesn't want anybody missing. In 1994, the Russian Department of Education invited two Americans to teach in a large orphanage. Um, this orphanage contained Russian children who had been abused, horribly abused in many cases, and abandoned. And they were basically warehoused, which is always an injustice. And so these two Americans actually got to teach these Russian orphan children the Christmas story with the translators. They took them through the manger scene. And then they did a craft project. They had construction paper cut so that they could make it into a manger. They had little felt baby Jesuses that they could put in the manger. And then they had napkins that they would cut into strips for the swaddling cloths for the manger scene. And they, they walked around and they watched these Russian children apply the Christmas story to their craft. And they stopped when they got to a little six-year-old named Misha. Because Misha's manger scene was a little bit different. There were two babies in the manger. And they were wrapped together in the napkin strips. And they asked him why through the translator. And I'm, I'm actually going to read the next part because I really... I don't want to get this wrong. This is so powerful. Misha made up his own ending to the story, as he said, And when Mary laid the baby in the manger, Jesus looked at me and asked me if I had a place to stay. I told him I have no mama and I have no papa, so I don't have any place to stay. Then Jesus told me, I could stay with him. But I told him I couldn't because I didn't have a gift to give him like everybody else did. But I wanted to stay with Jesus so much so I thought about what I had that maybe I could use as a gift. I thought maybe if I kept him warm that would be a good gift. So I asked Jesus, if I keep you warm, will that be a good enough gift? And Jesus 
told me, if you keep me warm, that will be the best gift anybody ever gave me. So I got into the manger. And then Jesus looked at me and he told me I could stay with him for always. As little Misha finished his story, his eyes brimmed full of tears that splashed down his little cheeks. Putting his hand over his face, his head drooped to the table, and his shoulders shook as he sobbed and sobbed. The little orphan had found somebody who would never abandon him and would never abuse him. Someone who would stay with him always. I can't read your heart this morning. You can't read my heart. But God knows us all. And the manger has all kinds of room for all of us. Jesus has all kinds of room for all of us. In a moment, we're going to come to the table. We're going to give our offerings. We're going to take the elements. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As members of the one body of Christ, we invite everyone to the table as Christ invites us to the table. So wherever you are in your faith journey this morning, if you are finding your way to Jesus, please know that the Jesus of the manger and the cross and the empty tomb he is drawing you in like Jesus drew Misha in that day because he has room for you. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen.